Switching back to transportation, how many hours a week do you spend at the wheel of your car? Let's explore that for a second. Let's say you drive 25 minutes each way to and from work each day. That's the typical American commute. So it's an hour a day, five days a week. Uh, maybe you like to run errands on the weekend for a couple of hours, tack that on. We're at seven hours a week behind the wheel. How many things in your life do you make seven hours a week for? It's a lot of time. Probably work, hopefully sleep, unless you're very sleep deprived. You probably spend that amount of time eating. And maybe there's something else really important to you that you make seven hours for, like uh, spending time with your kids or your spouse. But once you get past those basics of life, those most important elemental pieces, it's really hard to make seven hours of time every single week to do something. Even if you have a hobby you're really passionate about, like say cooking or gardening, you probably don't spend seven hours a week on that. Chances are commuting is actually your biggest hobby. So do you even like it? Probably for a lot of you that's creating like a really visceral disgust feeling right now. You're like, Bleh! I hate commuting. Totally. Uh, let's, let's just dive into that disgust. Let's feel how gross commuting is. Get behind the wheel in your mind. Look around you in your car. You're grimacing. You're stressed out. You have the tension of like maybe you're going to be late for work. Ugh. And what do you see around you when you're driving? Probably it's not a wide open road ahead of you. Probably you're sitting in traffic. There's a ton of other cars around you and they're clogging up your commute. But each of those cars is also occupied by a driver. And each of those drivers is also losing those seven hours a week. So why are we in this situation? Why are we alone in traffic and angry? Even though we're kind of sharing that experience and that direction we're going with all these other drivers. We don't feel their presence. We don't feel their humanity. We're isolated and there's a dissonance between the fact that we're surrounded, but alone. Why are we in that situation? That's because right now, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they're going, and we don't have a way to understand who those people are. We don't have insight into that. But we're about to see a huge transformation in our understanding of how people are getting around. There is a giant wave of information that's coming online now and in the next few years that's going to give us, the, for the first time, insight into this big jumbled mess of transportation. All of the chaos of the millions of decisions people are making every day about where they're going and when and how they're going to get there, we're finally going to be able to turn that into digitized data that we can organize and observe and act on. So with the power of that information, in our pocket, what could we change about our experience of transportation? What do we want to change? What should we change? So I'm talking about data. Big data is kind of a buzzy term. People love to say it because it seems really smart. Uh, I love to say it. But sometimes it's not that clear what shape it takes or what its implications are. So I'm going to try and clarify that a little bit. Uh, I've actually been right in the middle of this big data in transportation change at Buster, which is uh, a startup where we're building an online bus booking tool. And in the process, we're bringing a ton of data about a part of the transportation industry that right now is totally offline. We're taking that data and bringing it online and making it useful and hopefully putting it in front of consumers. So we're not alone in this. And in that position, I've had the opportunity to sort of be exposed to the reality of this big data precipice we're all leaning over right now, most of us without realizing it. There are some other startups uh, who are also building algorithms and gathering information and transportation, and you've definitely heard of one of them, Uber. Uber is the headline news of this category. They make talking about transportation way more fun because people listen. 
which is great, uh, but they're actually not the big story. There's a quiet undercurrent to all of this. There's a bigger story than Uber that's not being told yet. And that story actually started in the 1970s. So I'm gonna catch you up on a little bit of the backstory and what's happening right now, and then we'll have fun with that information and get into the futurism part. What's gonna happen because of it? So how did this story start in the 1970s? Uh, in the 70s, there was a lot of air traffic increasing. Consumers were starting to fly around. That was a normal way to get around. So the FAA, computerized and centralized all the flight data in the United States, basically to make sure that planes weren't gonna crash into each other in the air. Pretty good reason. So we've had a really high quality big data set about a piece of transportation since the 70s. And that's part of the reason that we already are two decades in to having really good online consumer tools to understand air travel. This is the old vanguard of big data and transportation, the aggregators like Expedia and Priceline where we book our tickets. We can go see all the flight listings for where we're going and book it right there. A lot of transparency, really easy to use. Where's another place, uh, a little more recent, where we're seeing big data and transportation? As I mentioned before, Uber. This part's fun to talk about because we're all experts. We've all seen it in the news. But why have we seen it in the news? Why is Uber and why are its competitors interesting to us? It's not just because they have created a really high revenue successful business by taking an offline industry and bringing a transaction we were already doing online, putting it in an app in our phones. It's because they actually created a whole new model for the black car and taxi industry in the process. And as they did that, they created a new norm in, in consumer behavior that totally shifted how we behave in just a few years. So what is that change? That's, it's the on-demand thing. What Uber did was they observed an industry that was dark, no data, pretty much nothing about our transactions for black car and taxi was even online or digital in any way. And they saw the treasure trove of potential if they could just get that data online and start to look for patterns and create new efficiencies with it. So they turned that into a business, they created this huge data set, they tracked where people were going and when, and it allowed them to create a much more efficient and instant match of the supply, a car, to the demand, the person who's just around the corner but doesn't know the cab is available. Uh, that's an amazing thing. Let's think back for a second to the dark days before Uber when we had to call painfully and pre-reserve a black car and then wait around for an indeterminate per period for it to come. Or my personal least favorite, standing on a corner and just hoping a cab will eventually drive by and take you somewhere. I've spent many rainy mornings that way. Now, you know, five years ago we might have been doing that and there was a cab two blocks away. Now, we know if the cab is two blocks away because Uber didn't just bring that data online, they did another thing with their tool that's very interesting, and this is the app experience. What they did was create data transparency. Also kind of a buzzy term, what does it mean? For Uber, data transparency is when you open the app on your phone and you can see there's five cars near me that are available. So Uber has this big data set but they're telling me just what's useful as a consumer. Is it efficient and cost effective for me to take a car right now or not? That is a huge improvement on the previous experience that's empowered by data because they gave that data to me as an individual to make my own smart decisions about how I want to get around. So this is a pattern, this pattern of a huge set of data coming online in transportation. Data transparency being given to a user and that consumer, that person, getting to make better decisions about how they get around. Save money, get around faster, a lot more efficiency. So why is that exciting? Obviously Uber already exists, we have this behavior. It's not exciting just to talk about it, but if it's happening somewhere else, that's interesting because what new behavior will we learn next? So this is that quiet undercurrent. This is the big story that's not being told yet. There are two other places where there's big data sets like this that are coming online. One of them is car sharing, and the other is buses. So let's start with car sharing, because it's more fun. I admit that, even as a bus person. <laughs> car sharing as we know it gets a fair amount of press. Companies like Zipcar is probably the most famous. 
But a lot of the car sharing companies we're familiar with are not really car sharing. Zipcar is pretty much as expensive as car rental. It's not that much more efficient. The model looks a lot like car rental. It's really just car rental with a really good app experience. I say that with affection, because I use Zipcar. There's another service that's a little bit more like car sharing, which is Car2Go, and there's similar services, competitors to all these companies. Car2Go is kind of more like Uber. Uh, so you open up an app on your phone when you want to rent a car for a few minutes to get somewhere, and you can see, oh, there's a few cars street parked near me. You hop in, and you only pay by the minute. So when you get to your destination, you drop it off, and someone else can take it. That's more efficient taking turns than normal car rental. But we all went to kindergarten, and we know that taking turns is not the same thing as sharing. <laughs> taking turns is when you get the toy and then someone else gets it later. Sharing is when you actually have to use something at the same time. It's harder. So is there real car sharing? Yes. There's a company called Blah Blah Car, far and away my favorite of the car sharing names. <laughs> blah Blah Car, Blah Blah Car. Love it. Blah Blah Car is kind of like Airbnb. It's regular people renting out access to seats in their car when they're already using it. It's just fill up the back seat. <laughs> Which, hey, that's efficiency. That's, that's smart. So on Blah Blah Car, you can log onto the marketplace. Say you want to do something like go from New York to DC. You find someone else who's driving there, and you rent your seat in their car. So it costs less than most other things because you're not paying a professional driver. And uh, that person's already going, so you're kind of just chipping in for gas. That's real car sharing, and that's really efficient. Let's say you fill up a blah blah car every single seat. So you've got five people in a car. That's four people who are not wasting that time driving. That's great. But you can only fit so many people in a car. This kind of looks like a Mini Cooper. Was that like four people comfortably, max? So you still have a lot of cars on the road. One thing that you get out of that experience that is really great is a new data hotspot in transportation, especially shared transportation. Because Blah Blah Car is going to have information on all the trips these people are taking. Where are they going? When? How long does it take? How many people are going? Are people willing to share that experience to save money? That's good data that we can act on later. But the efficiency thing is still a challenge. So how do you get more efficient than five people sitting in a car? you need a bigger car. Luckily, uh, there is a such thing as a bigger car. We have a word for that in English. It's called a bus. So let's talk about buses. Uh, probably when you think about buses, you think about ticketed buses. Stuff like a city bus or an intercity bus, like a Greyhound or a Megabus. Uh, this has been a, kind of an explosive area in the last 10 years. There have been a ton of new companies coming in and offering new city-to-city -city routes. Uh, and as a result, that piece of the bus industry has gotten pretty complicated and pretty difficult to navigate for consumers. So there's a company coming in now, kind of like an Expedia, an aggregator, called Wanderoo, and they're making sense of this new mess of data, which is great because that's another data hotspot for tr shared transportation that we can learn from in the future. The other piece of the bus industry that you're probably less familiar with, and this is where my experience lies at Buster, is charter buses. So that's when you book the whole bus with a group and also a driver, and it's, they take you from A to B. Um, talking about buses for too long tends to put people to sleep, so let's switch to airplanes for a second. Woo! Think of your favorite airline, or if you are uh, a malcontent as far as air travel, pick your most reviled airline, and just hold that brand name in your head for a second. Everybody probably has one. Imagine now if that airline only had 20 planes in their fleet. Probably you wouldn't know the name of it. And you probably wouldn't know the name of any airline, and they probably would be just kind of local mom and pop shops. Very different. That is actually how the charter bus industry works, which is challenging because when the companies are that small, it's not necessarily that cost efficient for them to use digital services to organize their business. Usually they're not using data at all. So this is another huge, dark, data-free area of transportation in our society. 
Happily, uh, the company where I've been, we're trying to bring that online. We're working with all these different shops. We're making sense of their pricing. We're learning where their trips are going to and from and how many people are traveling. So that's another data hotspot in shared transportation. So where do we go from here? Uh, there's one other part of buses that's a little more futuristic as far as buses go, and that's crowdsourcing. Um, there's a company called Skedaddle, and there's a few other companies like that, um, that are actually asking consumers to indicate something that's a new type of data, and that's where they would be willing, if somebody would just sell them a ticket, to ride on a bus with other people instead of driving their private car. That is a, that's an inflection point, that's a change point. They're actually asking for that behavior before they even have the opportunity like they did with Uber. So that's an interesting indication of where we're going in the future. We're switching, people are voluntarily asking to switch from private car to sharing because it's more cost efficient, it's convenient, it's more efficient use of time, and there are a lot of other reasons. So let's reflect on that for a second. Why are people willing to do that? Right now, we have this reality where when we think about traveling somewhere, going from one place to another, we think of ourselves as alone. We're figuring out the logistics by ourselves. But we already talked about that dissonance. We're alone, but we're surrounded by other people. So it's a little strange, uh, and it makes us probably a little uncomfortable with that, that we imagine that aloneness. The reason we feel that way is because we haven't had the data in the past to illuminate who are these other people. What are this, what's the shared goal we have with these other people? Who else is going the same way as we are? So our reality right now is only a partial picture and there's this whole part of it that has not even entered the consciousness yet. That shared experience. Imagine if I, living in Brooklyn, New York, thought of myself as totally alone in my neighborhood. That would be insane. There's, like, there's hundreds of thousands of people in Brooklyn. That's how we are about transportation right now. So pretty soon we're gonna be awakened to this new part of our reality and that's communities of transportation. What communities are you a part of right now? School maybe, clubs. The easiest one is probably the neighborhood where you live. I live in Brooklyn, as I said, and I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I'm a member of both of those communities. But when I take a bus to visit my parents from D.C. to New York or back and forth, I don't identify as a member of that community in motion. Pretty soon, I'm gonna have the opportunity to actually share that experience with other people. Their, their reality, their humanity, will be part of my ride between those two cities, and I won't ever have to travel alone. Even if I'm traveling among strangers, I'm not traveling by myself. That's that community as we move. So what can we do before those services all come about? The data's coming online, we don't necessarily have the ability to sort of opt into this right now. What can we do right now? We can start looking for those communities and becoming active members. Relate to the people around you who are going the same way as you and share that direction. And we can start creating a future of transportation for ourselves that adds to our lives instead of taking away our seven hours a week.